if you would turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15, which is where we will be this morning as we start, and we're going to uh, continue uh, taking a look at hearing God and uh, doing our best to try to grasp. Uh, and so we're going to be in Genesis 15. I'm sorry I had to turn on the, the audio that we're doing as well. Uh, but we're going to be in Genesis 15. We're going to take a look at hearing God. And uh, we're going to continue taking a look at where Abraham was hearing God and, and what happened in his life and what God did. And actually, Genesis 15 is a huge chapter for us, understanding how God works as he speaks. Uh, and, and so we're going to be there this morning. I uh, hope you've had time to, to turn to your Bibles. Uh, let's take a look at this passage. Uh, what we're going to do, and, and up until now, we, we looked last week at, at how Abraham heard God. We saw that God initiated the process. And then as he went along, Abraham began interacting with God and, and listening to God and following what God said and obeying God. And as a result, there was this, there was this relationship that was developing between Abraham and Almighty God. Uh, Abraham was building uh, altar after altar where he would see God. Uh, he was having more experiences with God. And then we come to chapter 15 where there's this huge, uh, and there are going to be some really huge moments in Abraham's life as, as we continue looking at hearing God. So in Genesis 15, uh, we're going to take a look. And the first thing we see here is God speaks to Abraham's need with a promise. In Genesis 15, chapter 1, or chapter verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. I am your very great reward. Now, we, we wonder, after what things? Because it says right here, after these things. Well, after what we looked at last week, uh, Abram was, was instrumental in delivering when these kings came, four kings, kings came to to fight against them, took over uh, the area of Sodom and, and other lands around it, took Lot prisoner. Abram heard about it, and as a result, he gathered all the men who could fight within his household and within his friends, and they went and delivered Lot, and they defeated these four kings. Now, after what things? Well, delivering Lot, after defeating the four kings and their armies, uh, after choosing to honor God when Melchizedek came, and he gave a tenth of everything to Melchizedek, but also after choosing to refuse the riches of this world, when the king of Sodom offered him everything, all the stuff that was there, and if he would just give to the king of Sodom the people that were there. Now, note that he says, after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision, saying, do not fear, Abram. So God was speaking to Abram. Abram heard and he heard God say, don't fear. Well, fear what? Well, I think there's two basic things Abram may have been fearing. One, he had just defeated four kings and their armies. There may be retribution coming from those folks. Now, Abraham kind of gathered up his guys. It was like 300 or so guys, uh, kind of a ragtag set of people that he was uh, gathering with him, and God gave him a wonderful victory. But now, once it's over, Abraham may be thinking, well, what happens if there's retribution? What if these guys come back? And then secondly, he, he feared that maybe in not taking those riches, he was not going to be able to have everything. Uh, he wasn't going to be able to, to, to have a wealth and, a, and an ability to, to have these things. And so Abraham may have had those fears, but here's what God does. And the reason I think those are the fears God speaks to is because of what God actually says to Abraham. And he says by vision, you know, and here, here we have for the second time, God is speaking to Abram. And he's doing it via a vision. And the vision is, is by the word of the Lord. So we need to see two different times it's going to say in this passage that it will be by the word of the Lord that God is speaking. And so as that happens, uh, Abraham, Abraham is in this vision and he is speaking. Uh, God is speaking to him. And what we realize is that God begins speaking to Abraham. And he says two things to him. He says, I'm your shield. And then the second thing that he says is, I'm your very great reward. And so uh, this, this wonderful idea that God says, look, I'm going to be for you a shield. I'm going to be for your reward. And so it, it becomes a, a, a wonderful thing that God says to him. And, and the beauty and the wonder of this passage is actually there's going to be this conversation that's going to happen back and forth between Abram and between God. 
And so as, as God tells him these things, and think about this. God says to you in the midst of a difficult time, I'm going to be your shield. You've just been through a military encounter. You've just been through a time where you were fighting in an actual uh, uh, war-type situation. And you really wonder if you're going to make it. And God says, look, I was your shield during that time and granted you a great victory. I will be your shield permanently. And then he says, I will be your reward. Now, the, the, the New American Standard says your reward will be very great. The actual wording there is, I am your reward. In other words, yes, the reward was great, but how great was it? It was infinite because God said, I myself will be your reward, Abram. So how does Abram speak after this? Because he hears this, but then Abram has some honest doubts and concerns. And Abram in verse 2, and by the way, God doesn't, uh, criticize Abram for having these doubts and, and having these concerns. He says to him, Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Abram was struggling, and he wasn't struggling so much with God's promise, but he was kind of like, well, I know you're going to be my shield. I know you're going to be re my reward. But in that day, you long to have a descendant. You long to pass on your family and pass on what you have in your family to others. Well, Abraham struggled with it because he was childless and he wanted a child to inherit what he had. He wanted to have a long lasting name. And at this point, actually, his child was a guy named Eliezer of Damascus. And it was basically Abraham's kind of right-hand man, one of his servants. But it was going to be his servant, and then the name would be passed down through his family, not so much through Abram's. Now, what we need to see here is Abram does have doubts, and he has concerns, and he voices them to God. But we need to know that when Abram had this doubt, it wasn't that he denied that God's promise could happen, but rather he was doubting because he desired God's promise to come into his life. He believed it was true, but he was thinking, how can this happen? And by the way, when this, when this takes place, God is more than willing to, to not kind of cast uh, him to the side. Uh, he doesn't just kind of say, you know what, we're done here. I'm, I'm going to someone else who's going to believe me when I speak to him. But what happens is God actually begins to answer Abram and begins to graciously and and, and just wonderfully uh, deal with him and give him some wonderful help. Now, what we see here is this. Uh, God then speaks honestly to Abram's uh, concerns and, and his, uh, his qu and quiets his doubt. Now, it says in Genesis 15, 4 through 7, Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him. In other words, God spoke to Abram again, saying, This man shall not be your heir. And what he's speaking about is Eliezer. He's not going to be his heir. But then he says, one, from, one will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. Now, one thing we need to know, and it's very important that we get this, when he says, one shall come forth from your body, he means not just Abraham. But if you remember, in Scripture, it says the two shall become one flesh. So who else is Abraham's body? Well, it's Sarah. And so God meant that one is going to be given to you, and it's going to be Abraham and Sarah, and then will come from your body. And then God took him outside, took Abraham outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you were able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And this is a beautiful, beautiful thing that God is doing with Abraham. He tells him to look up into the sky. You know, when we see the sky, we don't see the kind of sky that Abraham probably saw because we see a sky that, that, that is kind of uh, darkened or, or kind of over lightened for us so we can't see the stars so well. And there's so many lights in the cities that were around that we don't see how huge the number of stars would have been. Abraham was in a situation where if, if there was light, it was a campfire. And so when Abraham looks up into the sky, he sees a beautiful sky. Go out into a dark place way out in the country where there's no lights, and you will be blown away at how many stars there are in the heavens. And God said, look up there and count them if you can. And by the way, it wasn't just the ones visible to Abraham. Look up into the heavens. Try to count the stars in the heavens. They're innumerable. Earlier, God said to him that, that his descendants would be like the sand of the seashore. 
And now he's telling them they will be as numerous as the stars. And we know from our understanding now of, of cosmology and, and, and looking to the heavens with telescopes that the number of stars really are, are incalculable. We don't know how many there are, but there are so many it just blows our minds. Well, God says this to Abraham. And, and he lets him know that this is what he's going to do. And then what God does is he doubles down on his promises. He, he believed in the Lord. Abraham believed in the Lord and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. By the way, I'm going to have to back up because this is really, really important. He believed the Lord, verse 6, and God reckoned it to him as righteousness. This is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, that, that's taking place here. In fact, in the New Testament, in uh, Romans chapter 4 and in Galatians chapter 3, this is related directly to our salvation and that we are saved by grace through faith. We are not saved by works. Listen, there's no amount of works that you can do. There's no amount of works that I can do that will ever merit that we will be right with God. You can try all you want, but you will never do enough to be right with God. You're going to have to receive that by God's grace, what he did through Jesus Christ. And then you do that by when God shows you the gospel and reveals to you Jesus died on the cross, was buried. Three days later, he, three days later, he rose from the grave, all according to what was written in the scriptures and prophesied. That that is how God pays for sin. That is how God makes us right with him. So by faith, we then say, okay, I, God, I believe your promises. I believe what you did. And as a result, we receive salvation. And so in that moment, as this beautiful picture, and as it says in Romans 4 and in Galatians 3, Abram believed God and it was reckoned to him. That word reckoned means like, a, like an accounting term. It was given to him as righteousness. In other words, God made Abram righteous. We will never be righteous by our own works because we are sinful. And when we commit one sin, we are a slave of sin. We will have to be punished for sin. But what God does is he saves us through Jesus Christ and he gives us his righteousness so that we can stand before God, not based on what we do, but based on what Christ has done by his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Look, saints, what we're finding here is that when God speaks, God speaks using promises. If you want to really hear God, you need to know, here's, here's kind of going to be the, the situation that God is going to use to bring you to himself. God first is going to initiate it. Then God is going to bring you into a situation where your own strength won't cut it. You're going to have a need. And the need is going to be so great that you can't meet your own need. Then God is going to speak and he's going to give you promises. And those promises are going to be what you need to believe in in order for that need to be met. And then God is going to meet that need. He's going to bring you into a relationship with himself through that, and then he's going to walk with you in doing the things that he wants to do. Now, what does Abram do after God does this? Well, uh, God, by the way, he also doubles down on his promise. Uh, he says, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of Chal Chal Chaldees to give you this land to possess it. In other words, what he said earlier, God doubles down on again. And he says, I'm not forgetting my promises. I made this promise to you earlier, earlier took you out of her of Chaldees, I'm going to give you this land that you walk through to possess. Now God is telling him the second time, hey, look, count the stars, so shall your descendants be. Abram believes him, but then God goes back and he says, by the way, I didn't forget the first promise. I'm going to keep that promise too. Then we watch and what happens? Well, Abraham speaks again. And he hears this, and he hears what God has said to him. And he said, oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? Now, at this point, some of you may think, man, God's going to get really angry with him. But think about this for a moment with Abraham. Abraham was walking through this land that God told him to walk to. He had left the home that he had. And he was just walking through the land like a sojourner. He didn't own anything. He had, he had come to have possessions of cattle and flocks and herds and servants. Uh, and, and, and he had his wife with him and he had his nephew with him. But, but he didn't own one single foot of land. Now, we're going to find out later when he buries his wife, Sarah, that there was a process of deeding land, and you had to have a deed to know that you have the land. And so here's Abraham. God makes this promise. I'm going to make your descendants like the sand of the seashore. I'm going to give you all this land. But honestly, Abraham had that thought, 
how do I know I'm going to possess it? I mean, do I just walk around and tell people, God gave me this land. This is now my land. That's not going to go well. And he's thinking, where is the deed that I would have to this land to know that I would possess it? Well, here's what's amazing. Verse 9. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid them each half, each half opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. <clears throat> now God has told him, I'm going to give you this land. Abraham says, how am I going to know I'm going to possess it? And then God starts telling him to gather up livestock. Go get a three-year-old heifer. Go get a three-year-old goat. Go get a three-year-old ram. Go get a three-year-old turtle dove. Get, go get a three-year-old pigeon. He says, he's got five different animals. And then suddenly, like Abraham just knows what's going on, he brings the animals and he cuts them in half. And the way that they would do this was from stem to stern, from the head all the way to the rear. He would cut them in half and then they would lay opposite of each other. That's what it says in the passage. And it was a very bloody scene. It was a scene with these animals that had, been, that had been cut in half, and there was a path of blood that you had to walk on through it. Now, how in the world did Abram know this? Well, it's part of the history of that area. The way that they made agreements during that time was they made covenants, and what it was called was they cut covenant. And the, and the, the, the way that they did this simply was they, they split the animals, and the, there was a blood, and there was a path. And then what would happen is, as they made their agreement, they would hold the hand of the person they were making the agreement, and they would walk through that path of these animals that were cut in half. And it was a gruesome picture. But they would say with each other, may God so, do so to me and also if I break this, if I ever break this covenant with you. And they would walk through those pieces, and they would be aware of what's going to happen. In other words, may God do to me like has been done to these animals if I ever break this covenant. Now, before the covenant was made or sometimes after the covenant was made, they would go over the, the portions or the parts of the covenant. What were you agreeing to? Sometimes they would share their strength with one another. When David made covenant with Jonathan, Jonathan gave him his, his royal robes. Uh, they shared strength. Uh, many times they would they would plant some kind of a tree to commemorate it, and as long as that tree was there, it was kind of a witness. Sometimes they'd set a rock, and they would believe the rock would be the witness. But regardless of what it was, the covenant was cut, and they would walk through the pieces both together doing this. So that's why Abraham knew exactly what to do. He knew that God was saying to him, I'm about to enter into an agreement with you. It would kind of be like as if we say, if we were to say to God, well, how am I going to know I'm going to possess this? And God said, meet me at the courthouse tomorrow. And we would show up at the courthouse and he would bring us, bring us right into the area where they made the deeds. And then there would be this agreement all laid out. And then we would both sign the agreement. That's how we make our agreements, our covenants. This is how they made their covenants in that day. So Abram gets all these pieces laid out. He's setting them aside. He knows that God, and, and this has got to be a, just a really heady, awesome thought. God is, about, God is about to make a covenant agreement with me. And that's what's going through Abram's mind. And so God is saying, look, you want to know how you know you're going to possess this land? I will tell you. And he says, go get these things. Abram knows exactly what's going on. He gets them all ready. And then they're all ready and they're there. But, but you know what? It, it's through the day and then it moves toward the, the, the end of the day. And, and what happens? Well, what always happens? You have... Birds of prey that come, and birds that are that are uh, uh, like like buzzards and things like things like that, and they come and they want to land on these carcasses and begin eating these carcasses. But Abram drives them away and he keeps them off of the carcasses. Now, in the New Testament, and, and really just about anywhere in Scripture, when you see these animals, these birds, birds usually represent something evil. And so it could be just that, you know, they, they didn't want this agreement or the, the devil didn't want this agreement. That, you can go into all that, but let me just say this. There was a covenant that was ready. The birds of prey came and he drove them away. We can kind of try to read into that all the stuff you want. But the main thing we're seeing here is this covenant that God is making with Abram. And so what happens next? Well, then God begins to tell Abram the future. To let Abram know just who he's making this covenant with. Look at, uh, look at the scriptures in verse 12. Now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. Now, by the way, 
This is a sign that Almighty God is moving into the picture. One, because Abram is aware of the darkness. And it's the darkness of his own heart. And he's, in ter he's terrified. Now let me say this, saints. Go anywhere in the scriptures where you find God showing up in his glory. And you know what you're going to find? You're going to find people who are terrified. I think at times we, we have this view of God that I think is, is not scriptural. Like he's our buddy. He's, he's, he's the old man upstairs. He's, uh, he, he's just this person is going to be real easy to just kind of walk up and slap on the back. Hey, God, it's good to see you. You know what? If God in our state right now were to come down in all of his glory and begin to manifest that glory, we would find ourselves terrified. In fact, biblically, we'd fall on our face. And by the way, that's not just Old Testament. That's New Testament. All the way when you hit the book of Revelation, and there's John about to receive the revelation of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus shows up, Scripture says this, John fell at his feet like a dead man, and he was terrified. So as God begins to move into this picture, Abram is, is terrified. Terror comes upon him. And then God says this to Abraham, verse 13. God said to Abraham, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they serve, and afterwards they will come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, and you will be buried at a good old age. Now, and then it just says after that, then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. God tells Abram the future. God, in a prophetic manner, tells Abram exactly what's going to happen. Your, your people are going to be enslaved in this land. It's going to be 400 years. And what's amazing is uh, all of this could, could have been recorded by Abram. All of this could have been written down. Uh, it actually was at some point. And Abram could have known, is this God speaking or not? Because God is prophesying. Now, Saints, look, in the book of Isaiah, God throws down, beginning in chapter 42 and going all the way through the chapter 46. And God is throwing down idols. And he's basically saying, you want to know whether I'm God or whether your idols are God? He said, fine, let your idols tell the end from the beginning. Let them tell of events that have not yet happened, but tell of them now and then bring them to pass, just like they say. And God made, made it basically clear. He said, they are not gods. They're all false. But then he basically says to them, but I, as God, will tell you the end from the beginning. I will tell you things that are, that are going to come in the future, and I will bring them, and I will tell you them right now so that you can know whether I am God or not. Now, here's what's really awesome. When Abram says, how am I know I'm going to possess this? The first thing that God does is he sets down prophecy before Abram in a way that Abram is going to know that God is God. And he's going to know in a very practical way as time runs on, this promise is going to be fulfilled because God will tell you the end from the beginning. Now, saints, how do we know that Jesus is the Christ? Because the things that were written in the Old Testament, Testament all came to pass. You realize that there are over 80 different prophecies in the Old Testament about who the Messiah is going to be, where he's going to be born, uh, what his name is going to be, the, who's, who's going to bear it, that a virgin is going to be, be with child and bring forth a son. We, we were told all kinds of amazing things. How many pieces of silver is he going to be betrayed for? How is he going to be killed? And it was written in a time where crucifixion didn't even exist. 80 different prophecies. And, and you've heard me say this before, if you've been at Calvary, you know, the, the, it, was, it was taken that if you just took, and I believe it was eight of these prophecies, and, and Jesus fulfilled them, one person fulfilled them all in that one person. It's like filling the state of Texas three feet deep in quarters, and then taking one quarter and marking it, and then throwing it back in the pile and somehow mixing Texas all up. And then you're allowed to go in blindfolded and walk anywhere you want in the state of Texas, the entire state of Texas, three feet deep in quarters. And you reach down, you're only allowed to do it once. You reach down as far as you want, or you pick it right up off the top, and you pull one quarter out and you say, this is my choice. 
The likelihood of all these prophecies being fulfilled in the person of Christ is like you pulling out the right coin the very first time. And what's crazy is by the time you get to 80, the probability of Jesus fulfilling all 80 of those promises, which by the way he does, is like you marking an electron and putting it out in the universe somewhere and you being able to go anywhere in the universe reaching into yourself, reaching into your spaceship, however you want it. And the first time you pull an electron out, it's the one that was marked. God is saying to us, look, you want to know I'm going to fulfill my promises? I will present myself as the God who tells you the end from the beginning. I will give you 80 different prophecies that tells you all about my son and all about what's going to happen in his life. And I will give them to you at least 400 years before he ever comes on the scene and all 80 of them will be fulfilled in that one man God is trying to tell us his promises are real when God speaks to us through his promises in the word of God and we may think to ourselves well how can I know well first of all God says look I'm going to enter into a covenant with you but also I'm the God who will tell you the end from the beginning and so God tells us these things are true about the Messiah. You can know. You can trust me. By the way, there are prophecies all throughout the Old Testament. And they're coming to pass. And they have come to pass. And I will promise you, based on the authority of the word of God, he will not allow one of those promises to fall to the ground by the end of the age. And so God has done this so we can trust what he says in his word. Now the amazing thing is after God says that to Abram, then God does this. He says, it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between the piece, these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Kenizzite and the Kadmonite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Rephaim, and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Jebusite. Now, what happens here is astounding. God, after he has Abram prepare everything for a covenant, and all covenants were between two people. Remember, they'd walk through the pieces. They would say, may God do so to me and more also if I break this covenant with you. But the amazing thing is after Abram fell into this, this, fell, fell into this sleep that God helped induce, what happened was a smoking oven, which is a picture of God's judgment, and a flaming torch go through those pieces by themselves. And what God is saying is, I will pay, and I will be responsible for both parts of this covenant. I will walk through, and I will be faithful, God says, to fulfill everything that I said in the midst of making this covenant. And then God said, by the way, Abram, I'm also taking your part as well. And I will be faithful that if you break this covenant, and if you in any way disobey in any aspect of this covenant, the judgment that should fall on you, the may God do more to me, and also if I ever break this covenant, when you do break it, you need to know that I will pay the price. And what did he pass over? He passed over blood from sacrificial animals. I want you to know one thing. When God makes a promise with us, when God speaks to us and we have his promises. And saints, if you want to hear God speak, you need to get used to hearing promises. You need to get used to hearing promises in the midst of difficulties and trials and stuff that is beyond you. You need to get used to a God who says things to you that you just think, wow, how could that happen? How could that be? And God said, you want to know how it can be? And then God says, I'm going to tell you the end from the beginning. I'm going to prophesy to you of the things that are going to happen, and you will see them all come to pass. Come to pass. And then finally, when it's time to make the covenant, and you could say, yes, God, may God do so more. May God do so to me and more also if I ever break it. But you got to know this. You can't keep God's Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments were not given to us so that we could keep all ten and, and, and achieve a level of righteousness. Romans tells us that the commandments were given to us to show us that we can't. That, that righteousness doesn't come through trying to obey the commandments. 
What righteousness does is it reveals what, what the commandments do is they reveal to us that we're sinners and we can't. And let me help, help you understand. <clears throat> if you were to walk through those pieces and you were to say, may God do so to me and more also if I ever break this covenant, please hear me. The first time, the first time you disobey, you deserve the full measure of God's judgment to fall upon you. I do too. And here's what's scary. We disobey God's commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make an idol in the form of anything in the heavens above the earth beneath the waters below. You shall not worship them or bow down to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the, the children of the fathers of the third and fourth generation. You shall not use the name of the Lord your God in vain, for God will not hold him guiltless who uses his name in vain. These, these ones, you, you, by the way, you shall keep the Sabbath. We're, we're Protestants. We're really in a mess. Because the Sabbath is sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. You're not supposed to work during that time, and that's supposed to be devoted to worship. We have all broken the Sabbath like you would not believe. Then you shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. By the way, Jesus said, you, you, you've heard that it said you shall not commit adultery. I said, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery with her. And, and it, it says, you shall not murder. We think, well, I've never murdered. Jesus said, if you've been angry with your brother, you're guilty of murder. If you were ever to say to your brother, Raka, you, that means you empty head. And by the way, let's just put it in there. Fool, idiot, moron, just, just name it. If you're angry enough to call your brother a name, a disparaging name, you, you're guilty of murder before Almighty God. Then it finally comes down to coveting. Have you ever watched a commercial? And you probably coveted. Have you ever watched a commercial of a car and you think, man, my car is a piece of junk. I wish I had that car. You just coveted. We break God's commandments, and thus we are guilty, and it should be done to us, and more also. And yet God walks through the pieces by himself, and he said, no, I'll do my part, and when you sin, I will make sure that all the judgment that should come, all the punishment that should come, will be paid for, and he did it through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ took all our sins, all the sins of the world upon himself, and then he stood before God, and you know what he faced? He faced the judgment of God for our sin. And then he died. He was buried, and three days later he rose from the grave. And, and through that, God will actually grant you and I the forgiveness for breaking those commandments and doing those things. And so God comes to Abram. He tells Abram of these promises, and Abram says, well, how can this happen? Or how am I going to know I'm going to get this? God said, fine, I'll show you who I am. I'll show you you can trust me in my word. But then secondly, I want you to know this covenant we're about to make that's going to prove to you that this is going to come to you, I'm going to walk through and take both parts. So it's not on you. So that you don't have to try to obey perfectly. So that you don't have to live with the fact that you blew it and, and, and you can't make it now. What God is saying here is he's going to fulfill this by grace. And whenever you get into a position where you're hearing God, Please don't come away with it thinking, now I've got to do this and it's all on me. You need to know that God wants you to obey. Amen. I'm for it. But you need to know he calls us by grace. He doesn't call us by, you do this and if you don't do it, boom, you're going to get yours. God calls us by his grace. Listen, I've said this. And I've said it about myself. I've said it about at least our fellowship. You know, we're bozos on this bus. We're not, we're not going to do it perfectly. We're going to mess up. We're going to blow it. And that's why we are not a community of, we will tell everybody in the city, we're going to get it perfect, we're going to get it right, and you can look at us because we are the standard of righteousness for Jonesboro, Arkansas, and for the, for the nation and for the world. Look at us and you'll see it. No, what we tell people is this. We're a community of grace. You know why we're a community of grace? Because you can look at us, and you know what? We are still going to make mistakes. We are going to make, we are going to have problems. But we want to be a people who have been saved by God and saved by God's grace. We are seeking to walk with him, and we are seeking to hear what he has to say to us. And you know what? As he, spoke, as he speaks to us, we realize he's the God who gave all of his promises, and he fulfilled them. And he's the God who gave Jesus Christ. And by what he did through Jesus Christ, I can walk by grace in what he wants me to do. Saints, this passage, I thought about when I was studying this this week, going into 16, because you, you have the whole thing where Sarah and Hagar and, the, and the, uh, you know, Ishmael winds up being born and, and going into that. But 
But this is so important that we get this. You know, how does God speak? God speaks by his word. God speaks here in some visions. Well, let me say, all, even the visions, it says, the visions were given to Abram by the word of the Lord. You know, part of the reason that was the case, because at the time, there wasn't a Bible written down. And so God was revealing himself, and as he revealed himself, he did so by the word of the Lord. That's the way it was being given. Now, the beautiful thing is, we now have the revelation of God given to us in his word. And we can know the promises, and we even see the fulfillment of the promises here in the word and in our world even today. And the beautiful part of this is knowing this. As we seek to walk with God and we hear him, we can hear him by the word of the Lord. Let me say this, guys. I believe at times God will speak within your spirit, but you need to check anything you think you've heard within your spirit and make sure it's in agreement with the written word of God. Because I do not believe God is going to speak contrary to this word. But when he does, you need to know, how can I know this is going to happen? Because God, who gave his promises, has always fulfilled his promises. Then you think, well, well, then how can this happen in my life? Well, let me say to you, I believe from what we saw from Abram, what we see all the way through the life of Israel, what we even saw in the church, and what we see even to this day. If it were up to us and our faithfulness, it couldn't come to pass. We'd wind up messing it up, and, then, and when we mess it up, we'd wind up just being thrown over to the side. And God would move on to somebody else to see if they could do it right every single time. But here's the reality. God made his promises, and he will keep them. And then the other thing he did with Abram is he said, Oh, by the way, Abram, I'm also going to enter into a covenant. You're going to know you have a deed to this land, and your deed is this. I'm making an agreement with you, and I will keep both parts. So that when you walk in the future, Abram, you walk by grace. So that even if you blow it in the covenant, you'll know that I was the one who walked through the pieces as the light, but I was also the one who walked through the pieces as the flaming oven and that, that smoking oven of the judgment. And I'll pay it. And here's how he did it, guys. He did it through Jesus Christ. He still speaks to us in his word. He still lets us know he's faithful to his promises. But then he reminds us, if you hear me and you're seeking to do what I want, realize that you do it as a recipient of grace. It is not as you're going to have to do this or else you're in really, really big trouble and you'll probably get kicked off the team. No, we do this knowing he walked through the pieces. He paid the price. He not only is perfect in himself, but our imperfections. He is going to pay for it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And thus we can walk with him in grace and we can seek to do the things that will please him. And I love that it ends with God saying, and I'm going to give you all these things and these are going to be your blessings. And you know what? Since we read things like, like Ephesians chapter one, filled with the blessings of God, we read the word of God it's filled with the blessings of God. And we can know that God says, I'm faithful to them. And by the way, I've also provided a, a, a area or, or a way of walking in them by grace. And so as you are, are walking and seeking to hear God, you need to know that. He will fulfill them. He will help you walk in them by his grace. Not by rules, not by law, not by your own strength, but by his. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, I thank you for your word. Thank you for this example that you gave us in Abraham. How you told him and, and you spoke to him and you made promises to him. And then God, you even made a covenant with him, an agreement that you would be faithful to everything you said. And even when he was not faithful to everything you wanted him to do, that you were providing a way where he could walk by grace and not just by an instantaneous punishment that would put him away forever. God, thank you for that. Thank you for doing it for Abram. Thank you, God, that you do it for each and every one of us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray this coming week that you will bless the saints. I pray that they will seek you in your word. I pray they hear you. And God, I pray as they hear you, they'll know your promise is true and that you have provided a way of grace for them to walk out and walk through the things that you want them to do. Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for this. Thank you, Lord. We don't have to walk in absolute perfection, 
but that you have provided a way. And God, how grateful we are that it is a way of grace. I ask that you'll do all these things and bless these precious people in Jesus' name. Amen. And then what I want to do is, as we close, I just want to thank you so much for, for uh, watching on Facebook Live or watching in the future. Uh, just pray for you now that, that God will bless you, that he will keep you, and make his face shine upon you. In fact, so excited about it, I'm going to sing it with you. So wherever you are, stand up. We're going to sing this together. And we're going to sing our, our fellowship song. And our fellowship song is the blessing that God would, would use uh, for Israel when they came to their, their place. And they would sing this blessing, and we do too. And that's just simply this. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee, the Lord lift up his countenance on thee and give thee peace. May the love of God the Father, may the grace of Christ the Son, and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be yours. And as you open his word this week, may he speak to your heart, may he bless you with promises, and then may he provide you that wonderful way of grace to walk him out. God bless you, saints. We'll be dismissed. Have a great week.